So as she said, I teach about warfare and ethics and warfare and law, and I'm not going to talk about that at all, but it does tend to uh, influence the kinds of problems that I'm continually wrestling with solutions for. So when she said the theme of this talk was going to be something like, be the solution, I was immediately a little offended and a little affronted by that idea. How can we be the solution to things like nuclear warfare or nuclear proliferation, even though we're at the Center for Nonproliferation? I'm rather pessimistic about things like solutions to problems, especially in things like warfare, even though I teach about that kind of stuff. So when she asked me to think about it, I, and she said, don't speak about really what you research, but think about something related to a big idea and how one could possibly be the solution. I immediately started thinking that my reaction to that uh, must be conditioned, I think, a little bit by the sense that for most of us, if you're a member of this kind of cosmopolitan, wonderful elite that I think you really are, we tend to suffer from something like solutionitis. We tend to see problems and in a magic Seth kind of way, immediately imagine possible solutions to them. We don't need to be reminded that kind of thing. I seem to, all day long, I read the newspaper, I listen to the news, I read my textbooks, and I think, I have solutions to those kinds of problems that are out there, and there are so many problems. We have global warming, we have playground violence, we have lonely shut-ins, we have feral cats, we have the problems of the development and review board back in my small town in Vermont. There are a plethora of problems, and I could sort of, you know, throw out possible solutions to them all day long. I can imagine solutions and change people's assumptions all the time, but usually those solutions aren't going to really go anywhere, especially with the kinds of problems that are out there. I was thinking about the idea that, you know, partly every day when I sit down, I think I should be slow cooking local food and discussing global warming with my teenagers at the table to sort of simultaneously be a solution in a m bunch of different ways. And that tends to kind of weigh down, uh, I think, the possibility for actually changing anything, the sense that there are so many problems and so many different ways of being a solution. So that was the first way in which I was rather offended by it. I think we suffer from solutionitis sometimes. And this is a way in which maybe I'm the anti-TED talk here, because I'm also anti-technology. I'm using a piece of paper. Um, the second reason why I thought I was a little offended by that idea is I teach books in, I don't just teach about warfare, I also teach political philosophy. And in political philosophy, you're always dealing with the biggest problems, especially the problems of power or the problems of justice. You're always dealing with those kinds of problems. And in the book I was just teaching last week, last couple of weeks, Plato's Republic, it's, he stresses again and again the problem of injustice. How do we respond to the problem of injustice? And yes, we can imagine a city, the imaginary city of the Republic. We can imagine these kinds of utopias, but it would take a sort of tyrant philosopher to really put that to work. You would really have to be tyrannical in your attempt to impose that ju very just solution on a problem. And by the end of his Republic, he's walking away from the idea of being a solution in that kind of a way and really urging his interlocutors to understand that problems are multifaceted and you can't always imagine the perfect solution to that kind of thing. You have to wrestle with your own tyrannical impulses in that way. So those were my two initial problems with the idea of being a solution. Even though, as a well-educated person like the rest of you, I was taught by, in my own education, I tended to be taught by people who had escaped Europe after the Holocaust and pressed into us again and again the necessity for every single one of us, members of the elite, to spend our entire lives giving back to a culture that enabled us to achieve as much as we had achieved. So I'm not really wrestling with that so much as just how do we give back to that culture in a really meaningful way. So in trying to solve the idea of what a solution was, and now you can press my slide, I immediately did what a typical academic usually does. Sorry, I didn't, they didn't give me the piece of technology. I went to my trusty etymological dictionary. I'm a lover of languages. I tend to read dictionaries for fun. And so I went immediately to trying to figure out what is the, even the meaning of solution. I was thinking chemical solution, solution to a math problem. What do we even mean by a solution? And I discovered something rather fascinating, which was that the word for solution sh is the Latin version of a Greek word that I love, which is to analyze something. I always tell my students, don't give me a summary of the problem, analyze the problem for me. And I often use the idea of unpacking a problem. Well, the word solution is composed of two elements uh, in its 
earliest roots, the word that means something apart, taking something apart, and that lu uh, suff er, uh, suffix there, which means to loosen something up. And the Greek version of it is almost absolutely the same, to loosen something up. In fact, the word for analysis, analusein in Greek, is what Penelope does in the Odyssey when every night after uh, she goes to bed, she undoes, or after it's nighttime, she undoes the shroud that she has been weaving for Odysseus when he eventually comes home. It's a way of prolonging the time in which the suitors will ask her to marry him. So she analuseins it, she loosens it up, she undoes it. So I liked the idea of a solution that would be something like to loosen, which is where that word comes from, to untie or to cut apart, to release, same uh, etymological root, to unpack or to undo. And then the question comes, how do we actually unpack or undo what we're, uh, how do we undo things enough or loosen things up enough so that a solution is provided? The, image that came to mind in this rather, not passive idea of being a solution, but uh, a not so tyrannical active idea of being a solution. The image that came to mind was another Platonic one where Plato says, or Socrates says, Plato has Socrates say again and again, that I'm a midwife to ideas. I'm like my mother, he said, and another teacher of his who was a diotima, who was a midwife. He said, I'm like a midwife. I'm rather barren myself, but I help others give birth to their ideas. I stand there, I hold their hand, I support them to give birth to something else. And I liked the idea of providing an environment where others, where solutions can emerge from others. It reminded me of another thing that just happened to me a few weeks ago. I went to a seminar. My son is 16, my daughter's 13, so I'm raising teenagers. And I went to one of these like helpful parent, how to raise an adolescent, how to deal with adolescents kind of seminars that was at the local high school. And the uh, local pediatricians gave a talk about how to raise adolescents. And her first thing was, if you'd ever read to your children um, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day, some people might have read that book. At the end of the book, he has a terrible day, and his mother says, some days are like that. She doesn't solve it. She says, some days are like that. But her second piece of advice was, when you're raising an adolescent, don't just do something, stand there. The reverse of the idea. Don't just do something, just stand there. When they burst out of the room and go up and slam their door, just be there when they open the door again. Don't chase after them. Don't try and solve their problems. Stand there. Be steadfast in, the, in your attempt to solve their problems. And I love that idea because even as I study things like the International Committee for the Red Cross, oftentimes what they do there is not just do something, they stand there. They stand there and they remind people of their obligations under international law. They visit people who are detainees and they write down their names. And just that kind of problem solving actually ends up doing a lot more. The last image I wanted to leave you with was one that happened when I first started teaching, and I was teaching eighth graders on the south side of Chicago at the University of Chicago Lab School, and I was trying to teach them great books. We were reading the Iliad, and I had this idea that you needed to challenge kids with the actual fantastic great books, and you needed to teach them to have discussions amongst themselves. So I had this rule that I would take usually the most problematic kids in the class. One of them, I remember, was this kid, Vijay. He was always a problem when I was in front of the classroom, so I put him in front of the discussion group and made him be the discussion leader. And I said, after 20 minutes, I'll come in, because by then I'll be bursting with things to say and ways to interpret what they're saying. And I, at that mo uh, so I arranged it that 20 minutes, they could run the discussion themselves, then I would come in. And I sat right behind this kid, Vijay, and I watched him lead a discussion, and as the clock began to get towards 20 minutes, he put his hand behind the chair and just went like, don't come in, don't come in. Be there, but don't come in. And I saw this little, he was having such an amazing moment there leading this incredible discussion about the Iliad and the anger um, and the war that was going on, that he didn't want me to step in at that moment. And that, I thought, was an amazing metaphor for how to be a solution. Set up an environment where you can stand there and the solution can emerge from other people. The last event that had happened like this that reminded me was when I was teaching at a Native American school in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I, well, again, I was an early teacher. I was only 22 years old. These were the toughest, highest risk kids who were on the risk of just about going to be kicked out of this boarding school. They were from Navajo and Hopi and Pueblo tribes. And we had to teach them the Gettysburg Address, 
what was going on in the Civil War, Lincoln, memorize the Gettysburg Address. And as much as I try with all of my enthusiastic attempts to solve the problem of teaching this thing, I couldn't get them to do it. And finally, I sat down and I said, OK, so it begins with four score and seven years ago. Tell me how you say that in your languages. We've got Navajo, we've got Hopi, we've got different Pueblo languages. Tell me how to say it in your language. I'll sit here. You teach me how to say that. And at that moment, these students, who were actually some of the hardest students I've ever taught, they swore at me constantly. They got up and left the room. They did all sorts of things. But trying to think through and compare how they said that number in their different languages, which then got me to say, all right, well, actually, I need you to teach me some of your languages. I love languages. I'm going to spend the rest of the time listening to the people up there in the boxes, flipping through the channels. Teach me how to speak your language. And in that moment, our classroom dynamic really flipped. And they became the teachers. They became the attempts to sort of solve my problems. And that enabled us to kind of release the solutions that could come on between us. Thank you very much. Woo!